get into the word, let's open in prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this Sunday. God, we just come to hear a word from you, God. We come to have our lives impacted and changed, God. So we pray that you will bless your word, bless your people. Let the word go forth with power and let it yield a result, God, that will bless and change and impact their lives. We thank you. Be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So we are on our on-ramping series, right? Um, we're, we're, on, we're, we're doing a whole series of on-ramping, how to get on board with God. So we're doing this whole driving series, and you know, God has a sense of humor because he would do the driving series. You know, there's an area that I need deliverance in. I don't know about y'all. I don't necessarily have road rage per se. You know, I just do, I actively comment while I drive. Anyone else? I just have observations and questions. Like, what, what are y'all, what is, why, why, right? My kids and my husband, they always get mad at me. They're like, you know, they can't hear you. Well, I, I just need to vent. I just need to know, why'd you do that? You know, like, why'd you cut me off? So I don't have road rage necessarily, but, you know, I just have comments. So it's just really co coincidental that God would help us do an on-ramping series on driving. So thank God for my deliverance. Y'all pray my strength in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So um, today we're talking about merge, merging, right? So we've all been there before. How many of you raise your hand if you drive? Come on, y'all probably be with me. All right. We all been there before. You're driving along, open road, got things to do, places to go, radio. And then what do you see? That deadly sign. Merge ahead. It's either flashing or there's arrows or there's like the big construction arrows going, right? What, what is your first initial reaction when you see the sign? Oh, God, I don't got no time for this. Oh, God. You know, then, you know, you see it's all slowing down, right? Your first reaction to merge is usually not, yeah, merging, my favorite, right? No one's really, you know, are y'all with me? Y'all, I'm the only one. I have road rage. I'm the only one. All right, okay, good. Y'all help me feel at home, right? So, the merging is not the thing that we most, you know, are excited about. Um, I wanted to do a definition of merge. I feel like most of y'all missed this on y'all driver's test. I don't know why most people don't know the definition of merging. So let's review, shall we? Right. So to merge, to change into or become part of something else in a very gradual way to blend or cause to blend gradually into something else as to become indistinguishable from it, to become combined, united, swallowed up or absorbed, lose identity by uniting or blending, to combine or unite into a single enterprise entity, organization, or body, right? So that's the definition of, of, of merge. Um, our question today is, do you ever wonder why merging is so difficult? Have you ever been just in your car and just wonder like, why? Why is this so hard? Okay, number one is most people can't drive, amen? Well, they, that's just one off the list, just, just go there. This could all be so smooth if we could just all cooperate, right? It's just basic getting in line, right? But there's always that one rogue driver, maybe it's you, maybe it's me, I need to deliver. You know that one guy that never wants to merge? And they're like driving side by side with the driver instead of letting them in. And it's like, uh, somebody getting convicted. Yes, speak, Lord. Move, have your way, God. Mm. There's always that one rogue driver that just won't fall in line, right? Because why? The, the process of merging is always so uncomfortable. It's so it's inconvenient. Like, it requires patience. Most of us just want to just do our own thing, right? You just want to drive. Y'all want to deal with people. I just want to drive. Just get me in my lane and let's just go. I want to go, you know, about 70-ish and just go, right? <laughs> I don't want to deal with people. Um, but when you're emerging, and most of you guys have been there, you really get to see human nature on full display. In the process of merging, we're just all, we ain't talking about you know, getting over signaling. We're just talking about merging. 
You get to see all of human nature. Survivor of the fittest. Only the strong survive. I got a truck. Guess what, little compact car? I'm getting over, right? Me first. I'm not sharing. This road and this freeway belongs to me, and I'm not letting anyone over, you know? We see selfishness. We see a lot of that. You ever see, like, you're just being selfish. Let that person over, right? Selfish, and, you know, we, things we were supposed to learn in kindergarten, like not cutting, you know, being fair, <laughs> lining up properly. We're talking about merging, right? You get to see all of the human experience in one place, right? <laughs> um, and not just driving. We're not, I'm not even just talking about driving. Most married couples can attest about how hard it is to merge your lives together. Can I see any uh, amen from any married people? Amen. Y'all, y'all trying to go to brunch out and be like, mm, honey, it was, we were fine, right? You're trying not to get in the doghouse. But it's hard. Sometimes even married people coming together, merging is hard. What about new parents? You know, that bringing that baby home for the first time, it's hard to merge your lives. College roommates, can I give an amen? You meet with somebody you ain't never met from across the country, from another time and place and culture, and y'all supposed to live together in a 400 square foot dorm, right? Dorm room, right? Merging lives. What about blended families? A lot of us have blended families, putting people together, or even group projects at work. Lord have mercy. Getting the folk together, because we all need to get paid in here, and I, we need to all be on one accord, right? So we're not just talking about uh, driving, merging in life. It's, it's a difficult thing, right? So again, we're cruising down life, and someone comes up here and says, hey, guess what? God wants to merge his life, mer merge your, God wants you to merge your life with him and with others, and so we really, our initial reaction to that is like, oh, gosh, merge. You know, we have the same reaction as when we're driving. Merge, when we see the sign. Oh, God, God wants to merge. All right, come on, God, do what we got to do. Let's just get it over with, right? Yeah, yeah, people, come on, let's do it. Sometimes if we're not careful, we have that same reaction towards God when we hear, hey, I want to merge my life. I want you to merge your life with me. I want you to merge your life with other people right? So why? Why is merging so difficult spiritually? I'm talking about spiritual mer merging now. Why is it so difficult? You know, it's, it's really a giving up of self-will, giving up my way of doing things for God's way of doing things. And that's a difficult thing. This is why most people not fooling with Christianity, not the real Christianity that we're talking about. Most people will go to church, especially holidays, Mother's Day, Easter. We're going to be there. We're going to be at church. But I'm talking about really walking out this Christian life. This is where it gets a little complicated and tricky for some people because it requires this, this giving up of self and giving God complete control of your life. We're talking about merging, letting God have his way. So when we're saying as a Christian, God, I want you to be, we'll sing the songs, you are Lord. You know, we want him to be Lord. God, we, you are a master, you're our boss. But we don't want him to operate in none of those duties, right? That's just like you showing up at work, be like, like, check it out, boss. This is what I'm doing today. And don't give me no extra projects. This is my agenda. So I see you at five when I clock out. We can't do that in real life, right? You can go to your boss and tell him what you're going to do. But spiritually, that's kind of how we're dealing with God. Hey, God, check it out. This is my life. I'm going to be over here doing my thing. You, you just say, I'll come and let you know when I need something. And then that's all, you know, that's our, that's our, you know, little deal here, right? But is that true Christianity? And is that really, are you experiencing all that God really has for you? Or are you just think about it. Humanly speaking, merging is hard because we want things our way. It's just our base nature. Ask any one-year-old. We want, it's all about me right? We want things our way. I'm my own boss, especially in this American capitalistic society. It's just me. It's all about me. I'm my own boss. Do my own thing, 
right? I want to do what I want to do. I have authority issues. I don't listen to nobody. Nobody tells me what to do, right? We get a little, you know, we get a little touchy. Like, who let the wrong person tell you the wrong thing the wrong way? We'd be like, hmm? We don't, you know, we get a little touchy with the whole, you know, merging thing. But God, God is, God, you're here today, and God is speaking a word to you saying, hey, I want you to merge your life with me. And it requires something a little deeper than just coming to church. It's a giving up of, 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 of your own self-will in exchange for his will. And that could be difficult. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. This is a daily thing. It's not like you just come on Easter and be like, all right, I gave my life. All right, I'm doing my thing. No, it's your every day. God, I'm, I'm giving up my life. I'm giving up my will. I'm giving up the way I want to run things. I'm going to let you be the boss. I'm going to check in with you. I'm going to see what you think about that, right? That's the example of merging. Um, we, we want to turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at the life of Saul. This is the excellent example of someone merging their life with God. And the process that it took, remember in the uh, definition, it says it's a gradual process. It doesn't just happen overnight sometimes. All right, so if, if you can, if you have a Bible, if you have a Bible app, I would love for you to physically see the word for yourself. We're going to Acts chapter 9. Let's look at the process that uh, Paul had to go through to merge his life with God. Let's give a little background. When you get to Acts 9, it's going to say Saul. So this is Paul before he got saved. His name was, it was Saul. A lot of us had other names before we met Christ. Amen? <laughs> they called you something else. You know, had a little street name, a you know, little nickname they knew you by. So this is Saul's before he met the Lord. This is Saul before he was Paul. All right. Um, everybody there? Um, I'm looking at cha Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Um, it says, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, uh-oh, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So we got Brother Saul here. Before he knew the Lord, he was on fire for God, but in another different kind of way, right? You got to remember, this is right after Jesus died. The, the church was picking up. Everybody's walking around talking about Jesus was risen. And the Jews are like, no, he wasn't. Somebody stole his body. Y'all lying. And they're like, no, he's alive. We're starting this movement. It's awesome, right? So the people who were Jews were like, no, no, we got to shut all this down. Over here talking heresy and all this, whatnot. No. So Paul was like, you know what? I'm, give, me, give me letters. I'm about to get an official warrant to go to these places and arrest somebody who belonged to the way. You're going to go with me, right? And don't you just love our, this is, a, we belong to the, raise your hand if you're a member of the way. Well, what if there was a court order today that said, hey, everyone who was up in the Way Christian Center, you have permission to arrest them. How many people show up on Sunday? Oh, bless God. Lord, I, I see you, sister. Come on, me and you go together. And pastor. Pastor already been to jail. He know. <laughs> pastor Ben. <laughs> we roll with you, pastor. Right? So the people who belong to the way, this is, a, this is where our church name is. It came from the early Christian church. They were known as the followers of the way. And like pastor said before, it wasn't always a good title. It was like, they there's people following this way right so Paul comes here and he's gonna anybody who men or women he didn't care about women he gonna take the women too just they're gonna bind you up and take you to Jerusalem just a side note how many know that the devil wants to have you bound the enemy is always searching to for you to be bound in some kind of way whether it be addictions whether it be you know relationships your mind 
your anything he that, that's his that's one of his strategies okay i can't keep you from believing in god necessarily but uh, my aim is to keep you bound what happens when you're bound you can't do you can't move you're not effective all right so this was paul's strategy also he wanted to go bind them up here's a test of, to see whether you're operating in self-will. This is what Paul did. He was operating in self-will. You know what? I'm going to shut these people down. I'm about to make things happen. I'm on a, I'm, you know what? This is a false religion. I'm on a movement for God. He felt like he was working for God. He felt like he was on a righteous quest, right? Um, how do you know if you're operating in self-will? Here's a test. Do you talk to God? On a regular on a regular basis or only when things get a little out of control because most of the time we're like I got this little thing little bills little knickknacks little I got this I got this I got this I got this until something major happens you're like oh Jesus help me Lord you praying fasting you at prayer meeting all of a sudden but that's kind of how we teeter-totter with God if we want to keep it all the way real we can, can we be all the way honest Sometimes it's like, I don't really need you for the little stuff. I got, I got this. Money in the bank, I'm good. Got my relationship, got my little boo, we good. We don't need too much. Just need regular things, food, shelter, clothing, blessings. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> That's all we want. This is all we want. But that there's more that God wants from us. Amen. He's a, there's a more, there's a deeper requirement, a deeper relationship that God is, is requiring, and you're here, sitting here today, that God is speaking to you, telling you, I'm requiring more. I would like more. I would like more out of our relationship. I want to merge my life with you. But first, we got to stop operating in self-will. Amen. Let's go. Let's move on to verse 3. So he's going down, got his warrants in hand, and then verse 3 happens. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And we've been talking about the light anyway, so this is perfect. The light came on for him. He's doing his own thing, on his own quest, and a light comes on. Have you ever had a ha-ha moment in your life? You're just doing your own thing, going your own way, and then all of a sudden it's like, hmm, what, what? Why am I in this? What am I doing? You ever had that light come on? Like, wait a minute. I'm tripping. Why, why am I putting up with this? Or why am I, We've all had that moment when the light camp comes on. And for some people, you could pinpoint where that is. For some of us, that moment is today. God is turning on the lights in your, in, your, in your life, in your heart, showing you what's real. You know, when you're in the dark, you operate in the dark, you think everything is cool. You, you see things the way they are. You can't really see, but it is, and you don't really know what it, what's going on. But when that light comes on, everything comes to view like, wow. So that's our prayer, God, shine that light. Turn it on. Turn it on. Somebody say, turn it on, Lord. Turn that light on in my heart, in my mind, things that I'm blind to. God, give me that aha moment. Give me that. That happened with Saul. Suddenly a light shone from heaven. The light came on. Let's go to, did y'all see that? Um, let's go to verse, um, verse 9, I mean verse 4. Then he had a reality check. Verse 4 says, then he fell to the ground. You know, if you're you riding high, God has a, a way of bringing you to the ground. You think you're doing your, you think you're doing your thing, right? God will bring you to the ground, right? And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, when you, this is very interesting what the Lord said to him. He didn't say, Saul, what you doing? Why you doing that? What you do that for, Saul? He didn't do none of that. He said, why are you persecuting me? Why are you hurting me, Saul? Why are you going around hurting me? And a lot of times we think we're going around doing things or uh, talking about people or doing things in a righteous cause, but you're really hurting God. When you hurt God's people, you're hurting him. When you hurt human beings because we're made in his image, you're hurting God. 
Think about it. It's not, it's not, it, he was like, Saul, you need a reality check. You need to see that you're not just out here just doing random stuff. You're, it's impacting me. What might, who might you be hurting under the guise of religion? You know, we're notorious Christians of being, you know, a not so friendly group to people we don't agree with, right? But how can, how might we change that culture at this church? How might we be a more welcoming, loving community, even with people we don't necessarily agree on and we might, we're not going to change our positions on some things, but we could still be loving and kind. There's some people that you work with. There's some people you live by that God wants you to extend your love, his love to. And he said, uh, Paul said, Lord, who are you? Who are you, Lord? Because God came to him like, hey, why are you doing this to me? He's like, whoa, whoa, who are you? I don't even know who you are. Who are you? Who am I hurting? Who is God to you? Who is God? Because Paul thought God was something else. Paul, think about it. He thought he was going on a righteous quest for God. I'm going to eradicate all these Christians in the name of God. And he didn't even know who God was. Think about it. What are you doing under the guise of God? Do you really know who God is? Or do, are your actions showing who God is in your life? Paul didn't even know him. And he was, thought he was working for him. Th that's a dangerous ground to walk. You think you're doing stuff. You think you're being a good person. You think you're doing it. And God's like, oh, we don't know each other. Everybody knows that verse. When you stand before God, you'll be like, Lord, I did all this in your name. I was healing people. Yep, let me in. He's going to be like, mm, can't seem to locate your, your name. First name again? Um, who are you, right? We got to really know you. I'm saying this is the, my youth can testify. I say this so many times. You have to know God for yourself. It can't be what Pastor Mike said. It can't be what your grandma said. It can't be what your auntie. You have to know who he is. Who is he? If I were to ask everyone one by one, who is God to you? What would be your answer? Right? Who is he? So God, Paul said, God, who are you? Then Jesus said, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, this particular verse is not is omitted in some translation, but it is in the new the King James Version. He says, um, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, this is also uh, known as pricks also. And um, let me just explain to you what it is because it's really impactful. Uh, when he says it's hard for you to kick against a prick, it was a Greek proverb, but it was similar um, also um, and familiar to the Jews or anyone living in an agricultural uh, environment. An ox goat was a stick with a pointed piece of iron on his tip and was used to prod oxen when plowing, right? The farmer would prick the animal to steer it in the right direction. Sometimes the animal will, will rebel by kicking out at the prick and the result of it will be the prick will be driven further into his flesh. In, ex in essence, the more the ox rebelled, the more it suffered. Thus, Jesus' words to Saul on the road to Damascus, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Jesus took control of Paul and let him know of his rebellion against God was a losing battle. Paul's actions were senseless as an ox kicking against the goats. Paul had a, a passion and a sincerity in fighting against Christianity, but he was not heading in the direction God wanted him to go. Jesus was going to gird, goad, or direct, or steer Paul in the right direction. You're only hurting yourself when you rebel against God. God is wanting to merge with you, and the more you resist it, you're not hurting nobody but you. Think about it. We always say God is a good God. He's good all the time, all the time. God is good. So why won't we yield to his, his will for our lives? For us to kick against it and like, no, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my thing. No, God, I ain't ready for all that. I just want to come to church and that's it. But God is wanting you to go deeper. 
He wants you to go deeper. And the more you rebel against that kicking, the more you only going to hurt yourself. So Jesus was like, Paul, you, why are you kicking against the pricks? Just come on. Stop fighting it. A lot of you are in a deep battle with God on today. Been fighting him. God has been talking to you about different areas, different things that he wants you to surrender. And you've been fighting and it is, you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Nobody but yourself on today. And God wants to free you from that. How many want to be free? How many tired of fighting? Stop fighting the love. You remember that your arms too short to box with God? Remember that? You can't fight God. All right. Let's keep on moving on. So we're going to verse 6. He had a reality check. And now we're at verse 6. He says, so he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. So Paul had to surrender to God's way. It was a gradual process. Remember, he came doing his own thing. I'm going, I'm arresting, I'm apprehending. And now he's in a position where God's like, well, what do you want me to do, God? Now he has to surrender his control to God. He has to surrender. He don't, he's not in control anymore. God, what do you want me to do? That's, what, that's the position he's in. That's the position God has us in right now. If you're merging your life with God, it's not, God, I'm going here, and I'm getting this major, and I'm getting this job. It's like, no, 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 no. God, what do you want me to do? That's the position God wants us to live in a merging life. It's always under his, his control. God, what do you want me to do? He's no longer the high and mighty Paul. He's saying, God, what do you want me to do? I don't want to stop by verse 7 real quick. It says, the men who journey with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and his eyes were open, but he saw no one. Then he, they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, neither ate or drank. You know, some situations in your life that God is going to bring you to is not for everybody to see. It's not for everybody to understand. It's not for everybody to really have their say-so about it. These men were with Paul, heard a voice, but didn't see nothing. God's doing things in your life that some people are not going to see or hear. Or you'd be like, man, do you know God is... Hmm, I didn't hear any of that. Sorry. It's your journey. It's your journey. God's talking to you. And everybody's not going to understand it. And they're not going to see it. They're not going to understand it. But you still got to walk in it. You still got to walk in it. Sometimes it's not for everybody. And then he says, his eyes were open. His eyes was open, but shut. That's a terrible place to be in. Eyes wide open, but can't see nothing. God deliver us from that situation. Eyes wide open, can't be in situations and everybody see it but you. And nobody ain't been in that. I've been all, everybody know he ain't no good but you. You the only one. I, but I love him. I'm like, girl. Run. Y'all too, fellas. Everybody be telling y'all, mm -mm, she fine. I don't care. <laughs> eyes wide shut. Ask, we need God to open our eyes on today. Raise your hand if you want God to open your eyes on today. Come on, don't be ashamed. God, open it. All right, so now we're on verse uh, 9. Uh, verse 10. Thank you, sis. Look at people following along. So not only are we surrendered to God's way, this is the part where we all get to participate. Um, we want, I love this next guy who comes on the scene. Uh, we're not just saved for ourselves. You know that? We're saved to help other people. If, if you were just saved for yourself, as soon as the moment you gave your life to Christ, he could have just took you up to heaven and end of the story. But for some reason, God still has us here. Some of us been saved years, 20 years, and he could have just took you home to glory, right? But he didn't. We're still here for a reason, and it's to merge our lives with other people. I love this next guy. His name is Ananias. We're on verse 10. It says, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, what did he say? Here I am, Lord. What a great example of how God wants to use us in the body of Christ. God called him and he said, 
Here I am, Lord. A lot of times God calls us, but we on Instagram. God calls us. We too busy. We doing other things. I'll get back to you later. Leave a message, God. Right? I love Ananias. God called him. He's like, yeah, what you need, God? What, what's up? Right? Great example. In verse 11, it says, um, the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and acquire at the house of Judas for, the, for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he is praying. In the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he may receive sight. I love that Ananias said, Lord, here I am. But he also got clarity. A lot of us say, God, yeah, I'm ready to go. What, what? And we just go. But he waited and got the instruction. Okay, so Lord, what, what are we doing now? All right. That's just, that's for free. Tuck that in the, in the note later. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he is here and, and he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Now, you know, Ananias had a good point there. Saul was a dangerous dude. He wasn't coming to do no good to the Christians. He came to, I, I am coming to get y'all. So then God taps Ananias like, look, I want you to go holler at Saul. He's like, oh, hell, hold on, hold on. He sounds like, well, you know, us you know, folks in the hood, we got warrants. The guy tell you to go to the police station. Hold on, God, wait. Can't, mm. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right? He doesn't, God doesn't always call us to fun and safe assignments. Do you understand that? I feel like God should call me to be a missionary to like an island or something. I would be great, like a beachfront ministry. I am available, Lord, whenever you call my name. That's the assignment I am waiting for God to, fasting and praying and waiting. But he hasn't said it yet. But God doesn't always call us to fun and safe things. Sometimes, when's the last time God told you to do something a little edgy? I mean, are we, are we even listening for that? Because a lot of times we hear, we might hear and be like, mm, that's the devil? Ooh, that, where, that, where that thought come from? I bind it. Mm. I'm tripped. No. Sometimes God might call you to do something that's unconventional. And it's really from God. But sometimes we dismiss it as, no, I'm tripping. No, 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 no. That's our own beloved pastor. God called him to Ferguson. He had no idea. Everything that would entail from that. Out on front lines dealing with dangerous situations. We over here fasting, praying, worried about them. I know Mama Loretta was just praying for them. But God calls you sometimes to things that aren't so safe. Would you be ready and willing to go knowing that God has his hand and he will protect you. And wherever he guides you, he will provide for you. Some of y'all, God has given you great ideas, but you've been dismissing them. Because you're like, oh, how would that work? You talk yourself out of it. Stop talking yourself out of things. God might be calling you to that person, to that place. Look how this unfolded. Look at in verse 15. It says that, um, but the Lord, no, I got to keep moving. It says, but the Lord um, said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. He said, no, no, Ananias, go ahead. I have something for this man to do. What if Ananias would have refused based on Paul's reputation? Operating out of fear and doubt. Not believing what God said. He would have missed out on the greatest testimony ever. Can you imagine being the guy who got Paul saved? Paul wrote most of the New Testament. God called him to the Gentiles. Raise your hand if you're a Gentile. That's all of us. Unless you're Jewish, you're a Gentile. Congratulations. Right? We would not be here. 
Had it not been for Paul sitting down and writing the New Testament, teaching us how to live in his new law and his new grace. Look at this. What if he would have refused? God will raise up somebody else. But what if, who, who is God calling you to? What opportunities are you missing out on? The awesomest testimony ever that you're just like, no, I, I don't think God talking to me. Right? And I also want to point out from this, from this verse, you see Paul's uh, assignment, verse 16, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, I, I, I want to point this out because his assignment wasn't going to be easy. And I'm afraid that sometimes we bought into a false image of Christianity. That once we accept God, everything's going to be rosy and he's going to answer every prayer. And then a lot of us get mad at God while well, I'm coming to church and I'm doing this, I'm doing what's right and everything going wrong. Never mind. Right? Sometimes we get mad at God. We get frustrated at God. But sometimes our assignments aren't going to be easy. Some of y'all are dealing with some, raise your hand if you're dealing with some crazy stuff right now. Like, Lord, gee, how many of you had a crazy life? Like, why? A crazy family? Like, why? Maybe your assignment that God put you on wasn't going to be an easy one, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. God is calling you to something deeper. Look, what, look at Paul's assignment. We are all sitting here because God used him. What if it, what, don't buy into that idea that it's just going to be an easy walk. It's not always going to be easy. So then he laid his hands on him and Paul received sight. Um, and if you got filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to point out in closing that God saved the least likely person. The least likely likely per of all you could have named a top 100 none of the Christians back then would have said guess who gonna get saved <laughs> Saul would not have been on that list at all at all who's the least likely person what who is that person you've written off that you've said they ain't never gonna get saved you got that co-worker that friend that family member and you be like you look at them like whoo I don't even bother. I ain't gonna even say nothing about God. I ain't mention church. Just who have you written off? Think about it. Think about that person and start praying for them. You never know. Don't ever write anybody off. God will save the least likely person because you prayed and because you were there and you showed love and you said yes to God. And, 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 and while we're on it, God can also save law enforcement officers. You know, isn't Paul out there enforcing the law? Right? And some of us, we just, we all down, down with the pig. We just mad at the police. When the last time you prayed for a police officer? When the last time you prayed for them? God, what would happen if God caused a mighty revival among police officers? And then, and then his love will be shown in our communities, Right? Pray for him. Pray for him. So I ask, thank you, sister. Come on, we preaching with the Lord. Come on, Jesus. So as we, as we close, I want you just to consider. Consider merging with us at the way. Consider merging your life here. This is great, great soil, great ground. We're doing great work. It's time to get plugged in. A lot of us come we come, we worship, we leave. A lot of us don't know each other's name. We do, we do the hug and greet, and we just keep it moving. But I really feel that God is calling all of us to a deeper, impactful relationship, not, with, not just with him, but with our local church. We have a wonderful pastor, a wonderful wife, and they're doing great things in our community. It's time to get plugged in. Let's merge. Let's, get, let's come together and do this, this great work. There's Saul's all out here lined up on our streets. There's Saul's all in our neighborhoods that God wants to change their name to Paul. God wants to have his way in their life. Let's everybody stand at this time. I want to have a time of reflective prayer. I want you to think about Saul's life. Later he would be called Paul. God would change his name. I want you to think about his life. Think about when he was operating in self-will. 
Maybe, are, maybe you're at that point in your life. You're just doing your own thing. God wants to speak to you in that moment. Some of you are at the moment where the light is coming on. Maybe this is your moment where God is shining that light in your life. And you realize, you know what, I've been doing this all wrong. And you know, God didn't just leave Paul there. He could have just been like, you wrong and left. Right? He didn't leave him there. Once that moment comes on, God wants to take you on a different way. He wants to merge you into his will. Some of us have gotten a reality check on today. Some of us need to surrender to God's way of doing things on today. Think about your life. Think about the life of Saul and think about God's call to merge. A deeper Christian walk is deeper than coming to church. It's a total surrender of your life and your will to God's life and his, and his purpose in your life. No longer operating independently in your own thing, but really coming unto, under the obedience of God. And then we're merging, we're helping each other to merge together. Where are you at in this story? Everybody, please bow your heads. Close your eyes. This is just a time between you and God. Where are you at in this story? What areas in your life have you told God, I got this? Don't really need no help in this, God. But at any moment, that thing could go tragically wrong, and guess who you're going to need? God, we need you on today. We sincerely want to merge our lives with you, God. We want to become that definition. God, help us to change into and become a part of you in a very gradual but sure way. Cause us to blend until we become indistinguishable from you. Let us become combined, united, swallowed up, and absorbed in your will for our lives. Let us lose identity and our self-will by uniting and blending with yours. Help us to combine or unite into a single entity with this body of believers. 